Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I'm your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to Horror on the Orient Express in our Act 4 finale series. As we like to do at the top of the show, we'd like to thank you, the listener, and especially you, the Patreon supporter. You can support us at patreon.com slash the Old Ways Podcast. We'd love to have you over there. All sorts of wonderful things are happening for us in 2023, uh, including live events at such auspicious places as Origins in Columbus, Ohio, and also we'll be live at Gamehole Con in Madison, Wisconsin. With the proppers out of the way, I'd like to introduce the cast, beginning at my right. Hi, this is Mike, and I play James Robert Fraser, who is going into the woods. Indeed, sir. You've gone into the woods, an old, old wood that it is. And we'll see if um, you can find out what's at the heart of it. To Mr. Fraser's right. Hi, I'm Rena. I play Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy, and I'm on a mission. Indeed, it seems that you are. Let's see what happens when you get to where you're going. At the end of the table. Hi, this is Giles, and I'm playing Simon Griffith, and I do not have high hopes for the professor getting out of this episode. Oh, wow. This episode? Well, mark that down. And to the, Giles is right. Hi, this is Miranda, and I play Maggie Bellinger, and I'm having a flashback to me pulling Lady Elizabeth or trying to off of a rock. Hmm. Yeah, I could see where that flashback might be useful. Last, most certainly, at least. I'm Martin, and I'm playing Richard Courtney. And uh, after his drinking spell and uh, a resultant hangover, Richard's, I think, got some sort of blood sugar problem, and uh, he needs to eat something, maybe a door or a piece of wall or something. Yes, well, um, history aside, fairy tales aside, perhaps you have ended up at grandmother's house. So I'll raise the curtain tonight with an open doorway and what lay beyond it, which seemingly from the visuals that you get are a sleepy cottage with some space around a wide hearth and what looks like fresh bread just come out of the oven. So the woman that is standing in the uh, in the doorway, is, uh, does she say anything? Does she look surprised to see us or curious? No. She seemingly gave Lady Elizabeth and Miss Ballinger a wide smile, looked over the collected people who were there, continued to hum the tune that you'd heard approaching the house, and then turned around and bade you enter with a gesture of her hand. The tune that she's humming, is it one that any of us might recognize? A popular folk tune of the region or something or something uh, more kind of genetically uh, recognizable? No, it, it does play on some very similar repetitive tones, um, but you don't get anything from it that reminds you of a tune you'd heard from your childhood. Richard, for you, I'd like you to make me a power roll. Oh dear. It's 59 under 80. You've been here before. Oh. Oh. You know this house. You've seen this house in your mind. You've been outside of it. Was there a large soup pot going on? What, a large cauldron or something? An older woman and a younger woman? In your vision, the soup pot was outside. Yeah. There's nothing here like that. Okay. But it's not just the house. It's the smells from within it. It's the forest behind it. It's the chirping of bugs. Now that you're standing at the door, it all comes flooding back to you like some freight train of a memory. Who is this woman? 
You're not really sure. The younger woman sort of looks like the woman from the dream, but there's no old woman here. The woman in the doorway is, is young looking. Yeah, she's probably in her mid to late 20s. Oh, right, okay. Uh, she's got a, again, a, a sort of stunning visage. She's very beautiful. Um, she's already left the doorway. She's sort of gone deeper into the, the cottage here. Well, Maggie and I followed her in, so. Oh, did you? Okay. Is everyone else standing outside the door? Yeah, no, I kind of, I, I kind of was... Uh, anticipating that uh, her ladyship would have gone in fairly swiftly and uh, Fraser will will not be far behind her. When you enter the cottage, the woman is kneeling by the fire, seeming to tend to some of the bread, turning it a little on the edge of this large hearth that they have in the central portion of the cottage. There are a, a wide variety of things hanging from the wall and those of you who have gone inside the, the, the couple of things you realize the windows here of the cottage are shut it looks like they can be open but they are shut that could be for any any number of reasons she is baking so perhaps it's it's that uh, there are also a fair amount of shelves in and around the interior portion of the cottage where there's many many things some of them are pots and pans some of them are trinkets books there's an assortment it looks like the leftovers of a yard sale have been sort of become the decoration from the inside here whoever has maintained this cottage seemingly has begun a collection of sorts i think unless um, anybody else is uh, the first to break the silence fraser will clear his throat <clears> throat> and say excuse me uh, miss um, i wonder do you by any chance speak English mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so I'll just say it because it'll be a little hard for me to properly role play it here when she talks to you in between words she sort of picks up and puts down that same sort of humming as if there's a tune in her mind she can't seem to get rid of so she looks at you and she sa- she nods and she says thirsty mm-hmm, mm-hmm. quite Mm -hmm. She nods at you, Lady Elizabeth, and gets ready to stand up. And she turns to one of the shelves nearby uh, that is uh, carries an assortment of what looks like bowls, dishes, that sort of thing. And she picks up a pitcher and pours something from it, extends the glass to you, Lady Elizabeth, with a smile. I raise it in a slight sort of toast motion and smile at her, and then I drink it. She nods. It's um, very cool spring water. We've been pointed this way. Um, it, we would like, if we may, to speak with grandmother. Just at the um, mention of the word grandmother, even in English, she seems to smirk and almost glow a little bit like she, with, with pride. Of course. Of course. She extends her arm towards some of the wicker furniture that's here uh, around the, the hearth. There are a couple of chairs at best. Thank you. Uh, but will she be long? Can you tell us? Uh? Did you hear a strong, somewhat familiar male voice? Oh no, she won't be long at all. Stepping back from a deeper place, a fit and vital man walks into the space, known to every one of you. Good morning, Alexander. Good morning, he smiles. Glad you finally arrived, and brought the book, I see. Yes, well, you could have been more clear in your directions, brother dear. I could have. She doesn't seem annoyed or put out by it. It's just very casual, pleasant conversation. She's actually smiling at him. He steps forward towards you, Mr. Fraser. Fraser kind of back stiffens slightly. I don't think we've been properly introduced. Alexander. He extends his hand. Yes, as I'm sure you know, I am James Fraser. And he will take the hand, a firm grasp, and shake it. What kind of a handshake does this man have? You get the same in return. You don't get an overbearing, test of strength sort of handshake. Um, He meets you with a level gaze. And you don't feel any ire. There's no anger attached to him. There's no... You won't need a psychology role for it because he's being very open with how he feels. 
but he doesn't linger, right? He doesn't want to have a stare down contest, but he shakes you your hand like he would shake any gentleman's hand. Well behaved and not impolite or uh, observing the rules of courtesy and so forth. We've all come a very long way. Yes, well, you could have made it a lot easier by just telling us where to go in the first place now, couldn't you? Life is a series of challenges and games, and this is just one of them. You do take after father in that way. I do. So yes, uh, grandmother will be returning shortly. So quick question about the surroundings. Is there anything large and metal like an old kitchen range in here? Uh, not a kitchen range. Mm, large and metal. Something really heavy. Uh, the heaviest stuff that you're... This, this heaviest stuff you're probably going to find are some of the statuary pieces that are pushed into some of these shelves. Uh, some of them are made of stone. They're probably, I don't know, 20 to 30 kilograms, some of them, uh, especially the ones on the on the floor. They'd be real heavy if you were trying to, to whack someone with them or, or perhaps get behind, that sort of thing. So Richard's kind of, he's good at physics, so he's trying to... It's just a thought, because Richard has many of thoughts and not all of them come to pass, but he, he likes to think. He's wondering if he was to shoot one of these heavy things, whether he could get the bullet to ricochet off and sort of hit a target. Alexander, maybe. That's uh, a fairly advanced form of mathematics you're attempting to do. So um, I, I would be willing to allow you a mathematics roll. I would say it's likely at least... It, at least a hard success would be required to, to get something even close to the proper trajectory. Let's go for the, the red ones. Let's see what happens. It's 74. It's a, a pass, but only just. The hardest part for you, Professor, is adjusting to Alexander's movements because he's not stationary at all. He's not leaping and bounding from footfall to footfall, but he does seem to have a sort of movement to his paces rats. Richard figures that if he was trying to shoot him directly he'd probably notice and something would happen but if he was to pop a shot off at a statue or something he might get away with it. Never mind. It'd be complex no doubt. Yeah. Uh, excuse me sir I, I believe you have something of mine. I do. It's fantastic by the way. Very much like it back if you wouldn't mind. I think that rather depends on what you plan to do with it. Um... Well, I mean, ultimately, it needs to be returned to its rightful owner. Oh. Uh, which isn't you. Hmm. Possession, they say. The whole of the law. Yeah, I'm rather sort of angling on theft and honor rather than some street phrase, but um, whatever suits you best. What I'm intimating, Professor, is that it's mine, and it would be very hard for you to prove it's not. Right, okay. But, that said, I have no true interest now that I know what the device does. It's a bauble. It's an interesting one. But it's not really what I'm here for. It was more a, a ploy, which seemingly worked, to get you here. Right. So you're happy to return it, then? Certainly, after our business is done. I think Fraser, at this point, is just going to go and sit down in a chair and start packing tobacco into his pipe because this is both to be a long and very interesting set of conversations that he doesn't want to have any part of. We're not even here for the device, though. Uh, yes, we are. We came here to get a body part. Well, and the device. Well, no, that just showed up. I didn't realize it was going to be here. Exactly. We didn't. He didn't lure us here with it like some criminal mastermind. But we can't very well leave it, can we? It's interesting. You all want something very different. Oh, I think we all want the same thing right now. I think you're right. Well, what I want is a nice cup of tea. Well, other than Mr. Fraser, of course. He's always wanting something different. Just sort of looking at Alexander just with a sort of pleasant, benevolent smile. Almost like, oh, you're such a child. Well, until grandmother returns, I'm certain that there's other things here in the house that you're after. We came out all this way to talk about a, a simulacrum, right? That's what you're hoping for? Mother has some part of it squirreled away amongst all this mess? Yes. Well, we've been told. 
Sorry, did he just say mother? He did. I'm rather more interested in our mutual library, let's say. Indeed, it's interesting too because the two have some, we'll just say coexisting steps. You shock me. Well, listen, I, I've done some research, as has Sarasa here. He points to the woman in, in the woods that you met, who's still kneeling on the ground. It looks like she's making something in a cup. You're not sure what it is. There's a the liquid in that cup, and she seems to be stirring in something. I think what's fascinating is that there's a whole part of this journey you've held the entire time. Right there in the book. Well, sounds like we'd better get on with opening it then, doesn't it? Does. So, all of the investigators can make a spot hidden wall. That's a regular success. Bang on. 86 on 86. Nope. 84 over 63. Uh, Simon got 22 under 61, so it's a hard success. <laughs> it's my third chance at a spot hidden roll today, daytime. And I rolled <laughs> 90 over 62. <laughs> You could spend the luck, Mackie. I could. As much as I love having 69 luck, fuck that luck. I'm spending it so that I can pass this fucking roll. Okay, so Simon, unless Richard... Um, just, just a normal, so it was 61 under 77. Simon, you're the only one that notices it. A far up above, in the thatched roof of this cottage, there are a series of statue pieces, statue parts essentially. And hidden among them, you see like an angle piece of an arm and the, it's just the shine of it so much. The slight light in this room, the firelight that hits it, it illuminates just a section of what you think is the right arm. But it's pretty high up. Question, Mike, did we need a hard success? You did, yes. Oh, okay. Did we know we needed a hard success? No, you did not. Okay. How close to Maggie is Simon? Because Simon, the way it's been sounding in the conversation is behind Jim, Lady E, and the professor, since they all seem to be talking in the front. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Is Maggie up front too, or is she behind us? Behind them? No, I would say Maggie's probably up front, given the fact that she was one of the first people to enter the space. Uh, Simon's, with his long reach, is going to stretch out his arm and tap Maggie on her left shoulder. I would kind of turn my head to that direction. Miss Maggie, could I have a word with you, please? Is now the time for that, Simon? Yes. It's not often I say this, but now is the time. Okay. The young woman gets up from her place by the hearth and walks over to you, Mr. Fraser. Still humming that same tune. And Fraser is, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, do you mind if I smoke? She indicates that she doesn't mind. She extends her hand, one under this cup that she has, and one supporting it on the side. And she says in English, tea? Oh, uh, oh, splendid. Uh, thank you very much. She hands you the cup, which is sort of this earthenware mug, for lack of a better term. And then she returns to the harsh side. Is there, uh, is there any milk to go with it? Or, or is it just black tea? It's just black tea. You'd have to ask if they had milk. Yeah, because I was going to say, if there's no milk, so do you, uh, you don't happen to have any milk, do you? Alexander turns to you. We do. I can fetch some if you'd like. Very kind of you, thank you. He turns and sort of heads back. I'm going to pull my book out of my bag. There's a palpable feeling of excitement radiating off of her at the moment. The tome itself is, again, still impressive in size every time it gets pulled out. It's wide. It's got these massive locks to it. And you actually have to find a place to set it down because just carrying it is, is a bit of a weight. But there's a pedestal nearby. I'll set it down on that and then stand next to it so no one can move it. But also just there's kind of a bit of a nervous energy that she doesn't normally have or that I don't normally have. Just kind of a tapping of the fingers on the on the book. The hum continues through the space for a moment. You hear 
footsteps and Alexander returns with a small decanter and hands it to you, Mr. Fraser. There you are. Oh, thank you very much. Pour a dash into his tea. What kind of tea is it? Is it like a kind of a light... Um, is it black tea or... Is... I think it's probably black tea. Maybe you put a, a very small dash of milk into it and then set the milk to one side. So, Alexander turns to you, Lady Elizabeth. He stuffs his hand in his pocket and retrieves a handful of bones. They seem to be small, maybe inch, inch and a half long bones, and there are maybe, I'd say about eight to 12 of them. And he places them down uh, on the book, and then you see him assemble them one by one. He clicks them physically into place with one another. And then the last one seems to have what you think may be a, a maybe a claw or a horn of some sort that goes on the end. And it creates this very strange shape. Does it look like the shape of the lock on the book by any chance? It looks like one of them, yes. Well, that would explain why I couldn't find it. Hmm. He inserts it in the lock. And then he looks at you and says, are you ready? Always. Very well. He goes to his side and he withdraws a very small knife and places it on the top of the tome. Ah, oh, it's one of those books, is it? It's the way father wanted it. Of course. Cersa, Alexander says. The woman looks over at him, still, still humming. She looks over to him. Would you mind getting me that poker there? Sort of points across the room. She rises and walks across the room and from the shelves, she picks up this very strange piece of metal. And it's at that point when she picks up the strange piece of metal, there's almost a, a rumble that goes through the ground. And you begin to hear a, I guess, almost a stereo phonic signal, a doubling of the tune that's being hummed. And as she gets closer to Lady Elizabeth, you hear that song increase, this melodic tune. And you all realize that it's not coming from inside this woman, that this piece of metal is creating a tune. And that beggars belief. And so you all make sanity rolls for it. This is going to go well. That is a fail. 46 over 45. Right. I succeeded barely with a 54 under 63. Okay. Simon succeeded with a 46 under 59. Maggie failed with a 68 over 47. Mm. Okay. And Richard passed with a 29 under 40. Ooh, 29 under 40. Okay, so for those of you who failed, it's just a single point of sanity. Um, it's a little strange. You can't tell if maybe she's got an enormous tuning fork in her hand or if maybe she racked it on the ground somewhere. Maybe that's why it's making this strange sound. But there is definitely, definitely a strange sound coming from out of this metal. And she hands it to you, Lady Elizabeth. And you see almost a look of shock on Alexander's face. And you hear him say, what's going on here? Oh, brother dear, this is not just for you. I just sort of smile at him. All right, then. He takes his other hand. He leaves the bone key inside the tome. He takes the blade and he cuts himself on his open palm. And you see him wring blood out from his palm to one of the locks. And then he takes that bloodied knife and lays it on top of the tome and sort of gives space to Lady Elizabeth. Well, it'll hardly be the most painful thing I've gone through. And I take it and cut my palm. There's a burst of sound from outside, like flapping sheets. There's a noise in the distance that everyone except Lady Elizabeth hears, but doesn't understand what it is. It's an animal noise. A huge draft of air passes through the building. I'll get up and go to a window and look outside to see if I can see what's making this noise. 
Uh, it's hard to determine what's making the noise specifically, but what you do see is an older woman bent over a bit, dressed in very dark clothing, uh, wrapped almost in, in robes and um, clothing that has some, I guess, easiest way to put it would be some sort of embroidery that's been done into the, the portions of her robe. She wears a very tall wrapped hat. Her skin is weathered from many years, it seems. And she walks with a, a pronounced stoop. Her face is sun beaten as if she's been out in the field for many years. And as she makes her way up the walk, you can hear a growl in the wind as she arrives. And meanwhile, I've followed Alexander's movements and added my blood to one of the locks. He looks at you, Lady Elizabeth. You're the last key. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. Do you uh, put the key in? I do. Okay. You put the key in and there is a the release of a latching, a metallic latching sound that echoes throughout the cottage. The front door of the cottage opens at the exact same time. And this old woman ambles in towards you. And that would be towards Simon and Maggie, who've recessed towards the back of the group. Simon, what is it? What did you want? Look at the ceiling amongst all the the stuff making it up. There's body parts. I think I see one that matches an arm. Can I see it once he points it out? Yeah, so once he points it out and your eyes immediately go to this thatched roof, you realize why it's really difficult to have picked it out. The roof thatching aligns directly with the shape and direction of the arm. It's super, super hard to pick out normally, but when he mentions roughly where it's at, you pick it out after a while. And that same similar feeling of cold wraps around your shoulders for just a minute. And there is an immediate need inside you to claim the piece. Would you like me to Maggie toss you up to the ceiling? Well, I was looking around the room to see if there was any ladder or anything to get up there. Closest thing would be the tall shelves nearby. You could potentially climb on one of these tall shelves and you could leap from it to get to the rafters and then pick the arm out of the rafters. I was just wondering if Lady Elizabeth and Alexander are distracted by their book business. Oh, absolutely. Paying no attention to anyone else. Yeah. But I might need a bigger distraction from the old witch lady. <laughs> I will gesture at Richard and Fraser if I can get their attention and kind of do a little little point up, point at my arm, point up. I think it's reasonable to try to get their attention. I think the scene in front of Fraser is probably pretty engrossing. Just the the bleeding and all that stuff. He did get up to see who was coming in. So I'm, I'm imagining that his vision is going to be sort of following, you know, the old woman come in. But as far as as far as Richard goes, I would imagine his eyes are going to be on Alexander, who has his device. Yeah, very much so. So everyone's kind of engrossed in their own thing. It does seem that way, yes. That's almost perfect. Almost. Simon, I can try to get up there, but if someone sees me, though they are all engrossed in their own things, I'll you you might need to distract them or I, I don't know, give me a boost. I'm gonna go climb that shelf. All right. Well, uh, Mike, where's this? Where's Granny now that she's entered in, in relation to us? No, she's behind you for the moment, but she seems to be passing you on your left. Simon is going to quickly um, take his hat off and bow his head to her and, and say, Miss Granny. She stops in front of you just for a moment. And she reaches out a, a weathered hand and she grabs a hold of she reaches up and grabs a hold of your cheek and you get a, a pinch just a bit. And she says, you stay for dinner. And then she keeps moving. Um, as soon as she, she turns from you, Simon, immediately the woman who Alexander referred to as Sersa gets up from the hearth area where she's been working. And she runs and gives grandmother a hug. And there's a deep, like, genuine affection between the two of them. And they begin sort of talking, burbling about 
something in a language that you're not familiar with. Lady Elizabeth picks up a few words, oddly. It's not a language that you're familiar with until you realize that they're really just talking in a different intent about what that one is happy to see one another, that another member of the family has returned, that Alexander is here. Grandmother's very happy about all of that. Well, why wouldn't she be? Does Richard recognize the old woman? Yes. Invariably, you recognize the old woman. You recognize her from two specific places. One, you recognize her from the vision that you had of the old woman. Two, you recognize her from the dream realm in Mosan. This is the old woman that tried to get Lady Elizabeth to eat what you believed was human flesh. Yes. Has Richard still got that test tube of strange... strangeness that we find in Lausanne? Yeah, I would think so. Give give me a luck roll, because it could be amongst your things with Paul, or it might be with you. Uh, That is a fail. That is 66. It doesn't look like you have it with you. No, never mind. Okay, back on um, Maggie and Simon. After Grandmother has passed you by and is seemingly in we'll just say the midst of a Midwestern hello. You see your opportunity, Miss Bellinger. Oh, then Maggie will kind of like uh, creep back towards the shelf and then I, what she's going for. And I think in this case, swiftness is it's, it's a balance between do I go slow and quiet or swift, right? I I don't want to go too slow and then not get far enough and people notice me. So I will move with, uh, determination. Mm. Okay, so then give me your plot and plan of how you want to get up there. I will scale the shelf if possible. I kind of want to like get Simon back by me a little bit closer in case I fall or need a uh, boost, but I'm going to start to scale this shelf, get up to the top and, and leap for the arm. Okay. So I will advise you this as your keeper. Mm -hmm. You understand that by climbing this shelf and leaping for the piece, Mm -hmm. that there is no way to do this covertly. Mm -hmm. It will be noticed. Yeah, but I can't just leave it there. I wouldn't argue with your determination or your desires, Ms. Bellinger. I'm just, as your keeper, making you aware of the situation. Yeah, and well, and I think we can go to hell in a handbasket at any moment in time right now. Like this is a very volatile situation that we're in. So I don't see like this being a long drawn out uh, thing necessarily anyways. You know, it's at this time, if the comp had taught you how to fly, you wouldn't have any problems. I fucking know. Okay. I know. (laughs) And, And I was stopped from learning these skills um, trust me I'm aware that fly is nowhere on my sheet wow pour some salt in the wound why don't you that is actually a usable spell in Call of Cthulhu not Featherfall but they do have levitate I think climb is probably the way I would go you're trying to climb a shelf I, I don't think that it's climb for you to get up onto the shelf I think it's for you to climb the rafter portion or grab onto the rafter portion to, to grab out and sort of work your way to where you can get to the arm. Um, I'm I'm going to ask a curious question. I mean nothing by this. Um, are you wearing pants or a dress, Miss Bellinger? Oh, a dress. Okay, fair enough. Then please make your roll. Now, I have a 20 in climb, and things have been going great for me today. I roll a 46 over 20. Okay, so that's a that's a failure. Um, it's tw- It would be 26 points of luck to get you there I guess my question would be is are you the sort of person in this situation that would push the roll my fellow investigators seem to be very encouraging of me to push this roll and I'm not one to let them down so I will push the roll and in what way how will you push it so I imagine I I kind of climb up this thing See, the skirt is getting in the way. So for one, I'm going to hike hike that up quite a bit. There's a lot of legs showing here. 
and then I feel like I can't quite reach that rafter, so I'm going to have to make a small leap of faith to get out to it. There will be a point where none of Maggie's limbs are in contact with something. I'm already scared for you. Me too. <laughs> Five under 20. Because roll 20 loves it when I push rolls. Um, you take a leap of faith. And as you do so, with a hard success, I'd say it's pretty smooth, actually. Um, you use your genuine flexibility and uh, athletic background to come off the shelf, reach out and grab onto one of the joists that holds up the main bars that holds up the, the cottage ceiling and you pull yourself up and reach out with your right arm for the right arm and as you do so you hear something that comes from inside your, yourself it's a voice inside yourself but it's a voice you know very well and it's a voice that says in a definitive male tone I believe in you Margaret and you take hold of the right arm now this does not mean that you've landed on the ground just yet. So you are, at this moment, hanging on to both the rafter and the arm. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point that your right arm shoots with pain. And you become overcome with a racking physical inability to control your own muscles. And so it's going to take a strength roll from you to hold on to the rafters or fall. I will roll it. My my initial thought was I could just drop and hope that Simon catches me. But I wanted to be at least on my term, so I'll still make this the strength check. The 27 under 35. All right, with a 27 under 35, you hold on to the rafters and will be able to on your next action let go under your own power. That said, this is not something that most people within the cottage can miss. Lady Elizabeth and Alexander are very focused on what they are doing. Grandmother and Sursa seem to be pretty well focused into their conversation. There is sound that comes from your right, Mr. Fraser, and then also for you, the professor, when she vaults off of the, these massive shelves on, and, and, and like a spider monkey grabs onto the ceiling and pull something down you instantly see it and you think dear god woman what are you doing <laughs> and then you see the arm in her right arm i think richard is just frozen to the spot there's too much going on for him to sort of process so maggie's doing some sort of athletics up in the up in the roof um there's some sort of cannibalistic women in the corner and People are cutting themselves, and the person that's stolen his device is there. And he just doesn't know what to do. They're all barmy. Every single one of them. Everyone here is mad. That's the the determination that you've made, Professor. And you might be too, because you're right here along with them on on this weird, weird exchange. All right. So, Miss Bellinger, you can drop to the floor if you'd like. Well, you could attempt to one arm climb back to the shelf, but that's going to be very difficult. No, I'm just going to drop and hope that Simon's under me. Okay. I would ask, Simon, are you catching her? Uh, Simon's going to try. He's just totally discombobulated watching the aerodynamic Maggie fly across the ceiling. Okay. Uh, what would you like me to make? Oh, I'd like you to make a strength roll to properly catch your, your fellow investigator. 21 under 80. All right. Hard success. You land softly and securely into the arms of Simon Griffith with the right arm of the simulacrum in hand. And it's at that point, grandmother turns on her heel way faster than she's moved the entire time. You see a crooked finger come up from her left hand and she wags it back and forth at you. No, no, no stealing from me, child. Possession, I believe is what one person said earlier today. Miss Maggie, you're supposed to barter with them. Otherwise, you get cursed. Well, I don't have anything to give her. But what about Courtney? Well, I'm not going to give him. I could give him. But I'm not going to. We'd, we'd, then we'd be down a person. Can Is there a oven um, that has a hole the size of a witch? There is a hearth. 
It is very large. It could fit a person in, yes. Oh, is it lit? Oh, yeah. It's been going the entire time you've been in here. Gretel wants to push that witch in the oven, uh, but I won't yet. But I'll be thinking about it. I'll be planning that out. You weren't even using it. It was just up, up in the roof. Uh, we can offer to pay for it. Yeah, there. We'll pay for it. Yes, yes. We have money. Quite a lot of it. Uh, Professor, Miss Maggie, I don't think she wants money. Pardon, pardon, Miss Granny, but um, Miss Maggie here has been crossing Europe collecting these special pieces for herself, and I'm afraid she got excited. Is there anything we can do? Hmm. You take from me, I take from you. God damn it, Maggie. I have extra body parts. We'll be fine. Your parts are perfectly fine. Make a power roll, Maggie. Okay. This is, of course, contested. 12 under 75. Ooh, that's a good roll. 12 under 75. It's extreme success. Okay. Um, you feel your stomach get hit with debilitating pain. It isn't that you're not in pain because of the successful power roll. It's that you don't double over and curl up into a fetal ball because of it. Yeah. Uh, but you know for a fact that whatever she did, whatever was done to you, came from her. You in, in immediately know that. Yep. Uh, but I find power in the fact that I stay upright and stare directly at her. I see our guests need manners. Lady Elizabeth, the book unlocks. There's a deep sigh of satisfaction, and I'm going to pull it in my direction before Alexander can get his grimy little hands on it. Uh, he seemingly has no interest in the book. He doesn't stop you from taking it. He does take the bone key that was in one of the locks. That's fine. He, he can have it as a treat. Could I possibly make a psychology roll? Because when, when the book pops open, I'm watching Alexander intently, especially if he gives no sign that he's interested in having the book because this is kind of contrary to my expectations. And I'm really wondering, what exactly does he want? He's got to want something. Alexander takes the bone key and sets it on the table that was used to support the lock. He resheathes the dagger with the spent blood. You've come a long way for it. You hear grandmother's voice pick up in the room and she says now now manners manners I can't have thieves in my house this is something that catches everybody's attention I briefly glance in Maggie's direction and just sort of shake my head she's now holding the arm can I hold it up so you can see it um, you can go ahead and make a psychology roll Mr. Fraser before we pass that by oh, okay thank you that is a 91 over 63. Almost 30 points of luck to make that a success. I don't think I'll bother with it. You won't have to because the Hand of Fate is going to make it a success. Okay. Thank you, Hand of Fate. Uh, so you have a bit of a revelation based on his body language. The thing that he seems most interested in, at least at this point, was collecting the dagger. Remind me where the dagger came from. Well, the dagger came from him, from his hip, where he wears it. And it's what he struck and opened his hand with. And then likewise, Lady Elizabeth opened her hand, a wound on her hand with it, which of course is now a bit covered up because she's carrying the book. Um, but they both seemingly bled into this lock, this central locking mechanism. Sorry, I'm just trying to understand what you mean. He, he came here for something he already had. No. There's blood on the dagger. Right. Oh, right. Oh, he came for Lady Elizabeth's blood. So that is the revelation that you come to with the psychology roll. Okay. Um, where is the dagger now? It's in his pocket, in his sheath. Okay. He keeps it. Yeah, you, you, as far as you, you are concerned, Miss Bellinger, you have what you came for, but the, um, the old lady seems pissed. Oh, shit. I'm kind of pissed, too, you know? Look. We came here for this. We have a letter or something that says we can take it. 
<laughs> Just laughable. M- Miss Maggie, you're only digging yourself in deeper. You have this gentleman here that it's horrible, and this is obviously a trap of some sort. M- Miss Maggie. What? Uh, I- I'm barely keeping it together over here. You're scaring the hell out of me. Miss Granny, I'm really, really sorry about what Miss Maggie here has done. Is there anything I have that can offer any kind of compensation for what has occurred? I start going through my bag to see what I have. The old woman goes to the side of the hearth quicker than her form would allow. She produces a shovel. She returns to you, Simon, and she shovels under your feet. It's a fighting brawl wall, which you're willing to contest. Ooh, wow. Look, I'm not going to be sabot shoveled right now, so. That's not what I'm thinking. Oh, I, I know, and I'm scared. <laughs> no, I do not want to be shoveled. Would Richard be able to grab onto Simon to sort of help in, in any way? Not as of yet. Okay. So what kind of role do you want me to make? A brawl? It's fighting brawl to fight back, or it's dodge. Your choice. It's going to be dodge. Okay. Okay, the question is, is that the 66 over 53? Mm Mm-hmm. What do I need to spend it to? I would just say that you are fighting back against, or dodging a hard success. So if I beat 39 since it's a dodge, I would win on the tie? You would dodge, yes. 39 luck spent. Okay, you dodge. And when you dodge, you have to actually physically step back, you know, a couple of feet to get out from under her movements. When this happens, Cersa turns to you, Lady Elizabeth, and she says, go now, run. And the significance of her saying that to you is, you realize that she is no longer humming. I take my book and I leave. Let's get a read on what everybody else is doing before I take any other actions. Because technically we're going to drop into combat rounds. Because you've pissed off the old lady in the shoe. All right, so Maggie, your dex is pretty high, right? Uh, my dex is 85. So you're going to end up going first because no one has a pistol out yet. Uh, if memory serves correctly, Mr. Griffith is after that. He is also fast. He is 80. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to look the rest of them up if you would mind. 60. I have 50 here. All right. Lady Elizabeth. 64. All oh, right. I'll give you this much, Miss Bellinger. The grandmother, shovel in hand, is looking to put someone into her hearth fire. I'm telling you that that's her intent because at the top of the round, you would get somewhat of a a moment to understand what's going on before you take your movement. I would also say that the younger woman who is kneeling at the hearth has turned to the group and she has produced a blade. Do with that what you will. Alexander seems to be standing back um, is the woman near the fire, the old woman close enough to the fire? I want to yeah. shove her. I want to run over and shove her towards the fire. You know, push her into the fireplace? Yep. The hearth? Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's a fighting brawl roll. Okay. Which is contested. Okay. Ooh, we're back down again. The roller coaster ride that is roll 20, 92 over 40. Okay, very good. Uh, she resists, uh, and when she does, she is going to deal you damage. So you try to push her, and when you try to push her, um, she basically she uses that crooked finger, and she pushes it right into your esophagus for a point of damage. All righty. You go. <laughs> All right, Simon, you're on 80. If you were nearly shoveled last turn. Well, Simon um, took a few steps back, saw Maggie charge forward. He's really concerned because he doesn't think Miss Maggie chose wisely and he's also already scared enough that he's didn't just let the granny shovel him but he's going to reach in to his coat and take out one of his new throwing daggers and what is Alexander doing? Uh, Nothing. He's standing back. He is seemingly not producing any sort of weapon. He seems to be watching this unfold. All right. Then Simon's going to hold the rest of his action, if that's okay. Sure, certainly. Uh, So for those of you, like, 
Simon and Maggie, who would be close. If memory serves correctly, Lady Elizabeth is already running from the house. Um, is anyone else going to use their action to flee? Or did she start running away before? Yeah, she technically did before rounds came down. She's got the book open and she's making like a tree and getting out of here, as Viv Tannen might say. Where is the um, simulacrum arm at the moment? It's in Miss Bellinger's hand. Right arm for right arm. I think I'm next then. Um, uh, yes, sir, you are. I am going to take my revolver from my pocket and have it by my side. Not aiming it at anybody. I'm taking it from my pocket, making it quite clear to um, everyone in the room that I'm taking a revolver from my pocket. Okay. So we'll, we'll have Martin's action, and then we'll uh, we'll move on from there. Is Richard able to draw the toilet gun and fire in one round? Oh, certainly. Perfect. He's going to draw his gun and try and shoot Alexander. Go for it. His nemesis. Oh, God. Uh, I think a 98 is not a good number, is it? It is not. I'm going to play a hand of fate and make it a fumble. It's a revolver, and so the gun, the cylinder doesn't click all the way over. And when it does, you sort of pull on it a little bit more, and it still doesn't click over. You don't know if maybe the, I don't know, maybe all the moisture from the inside of the toilets corroded something. Maybe Fraser's didn't didn't clean it as well as he was supposed to. You curse the gun, but you don't seem to squeeze the shot off, and you'll have to clear the gun with, I think, if memory serves correctly, it's a successful firearms roll or mechanical repair to, to get it to work. Everybody except Lady Elizabeth can roll spot hidden. She doesn't need to because she's fled the room. 87. I'll, I'll spend a point of luck to make that a success, I think. Oh, how how, uh, how generous of you. Okay, following uh, gem 79 over 61, that's a fail. Okay. Hard success for Maggie. 85. Mm -hmm. Maggie, it's so fitting that you have a hard success for this specific thing. Uh, in front of you, because you were busy trying to cook grandmother, in front of you, the hearth comes alive. It grows and grows several feet. You see a wash of eyes adorn the front of the hearth as it seems to begin to step out from the space that it's in, and the bricks beneath become long, dark teeth that edge the row of this. And there is a cackle that rides out of the cottage on the air. It chases you, Lady Elizabeth, from the cottage, and you know with certainty that the rage of Mother has arrived. And that is not something you want anything to do with. Okay, so Miss Bellinger, I'm going to have you make a sand roll. And the rest of you as well. But for this specific instance, Maggie first. It's a 70 over 47. Oh, that is not great. Now, Miss Bellinger, lose three sanity. And then the rest of you, if you would. Oh, goodness me. I actually succeeded. That's a 15 under 44. Fantastic. Just one then. Following Mr. Fraser, that is a 29 under 59, so that's a hard sand success. Oh, very good. Uh, lose a point of sanity. Oh, 25 under 40. Yeah, fantastic. Just the one. Uh, you all see something which is terrifying and fantastic, and you want to be nowhere near, because it appears that the inside of Grandmother's house is birthing something enormous. And uh, Cersei is going to go because it is now her action. Uh, she takes the blade that's in her hand and she turns towards this growing, enormous pit. And Miss Bellinger is probably the only one that sees what happens directly. She takes the long portion of that knife and she seems to cut along her lower abdomen, completely parallel with her body and blood coats the front of this space. Nothing additional spills out. You can tell that she's holding, likely, her own internal organs together. But there is a distinct word that she begins speaking into the air. And the only sort of snips that you get of it are something called shup nukrat. 
She says them over and over and over again, and she'll spend 10 points of magic. So uh, at the top of the round, Miss Bellinger. Fuck this old lady. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Me and my arm. Okay. You exit the cottage because you have more than enough move to do so. Mm -hmm. As you exit the cottage, you see um, Lady Elizabeth has almost gotten to the end of that bramble thorn fence. And there is a strange feeling that is coming through the air. There's, a, there's almost a ground pounding that's coming through the air. Mm -hmm. It is definitive. It is frightening. And it matches the pace of your heartbeat as you exit the house. Simon on 80. So I have seen, even though I failed to spot hit in a creature, climb out of the fire, or is it part of the fire, or what? I think it's part of the fire. You would akin this to a um, like a home spirit, as some sort of defensive, natural, you know, hate, a spirit that's here to protect the house. All right. So Simon slides the dagger back into the sheath and yells. Jim, Hafesa, run! And then pulls out the other two sticks of dynamite instead and tosses them at the fire. As he's backing towards the... He wants to be at the door frame when he tosses them. Oh, boy. Okay. So, of course, that'll be a throw roll. And I would say this, as I believe in the beauty of narrative, you still have friendly investigators in the house. And if the dynamite goes off in the hearth, they will likely be caught in the blast. Okay, I will hold my action then. Okay. Because I have yelled for them to get out. And what are they doing? Because, I mean, we're, we're fucked if they don't run. I'm happy with having him shout and tell people to go on his turn. And if you want to say that you move towards the doorway, that you pull out the dynamite and then hold the rest of your action, I'm perfectly fine with that. It will give the um, rest of your compatriots at least a clear understanding of what you're up to. So now that that's sorted, on 64... Lady Elizabeth, um, are you continuing your movement outside? Yes, told to keep going, so at least want to get out of the range of the bramble fence because that's the territory marked out. You notice that the ground outside is beginning to move up, that the property line itself is beginning to rise. You notice that because you have to leap down to get out of the bramble fence, and you also realize that things have gone very badly here. Americans. So I'm moving past that. Just shaking my head, holding my book. I just want to read in peace. Why can't people just let me read in peace? That's a great question. On 60, Mr. Fraser. How did Alexander react to having a gun pointed at him, even though it just went click? Probably shocked a little bit. Um, and when it clicked, you probably saw him smile. I think um, Fraser is very quickly going to take in the situation. He will start moving in a rapid speed towards the uh, the door and just say, Thank you very much for the tea. We must be going. Come along, Professor. Okay. You have more than enough move to also exit the house. We know that you have your service revolver out and ready should it become necessary in the future. So, like I tell anybody that I would normally play with, Remember that you only get your dex bonus to initiative when you're planning to point and use the gun. So, uh, but barring that, given that, Richard, you have a gun yourself. Um, so I would just speak to that. If you'd like to make a me mechanical repair roll to be able to use the weapon, you can. Or a firearms roll, your choice. But that means he wouldn't be able to move, wouldn't it? I would just say that given that it's a revolver, the mechanics of a revolver are very simple. Hmm. It's not a magazine weapon. It doesn't have a slide. It has a very simple mechanical portion. If he thinks he could repair it, shoot it, and get out the door in one round, he would do that. I think you could probably get it right, and you could probably shoot it, but I don't think movement afterwards is going to be available to you. So I think what Richard will do, and that the first bit's really just for theatrical purposes. So again, if this costs too much time, then he, he wouldn't do it. Um, but I think Richard will just take one look at the gun, think, fucking piece of shit, and then throw it at Alexander and peg it out the door. Okay. You throw the gun at him. Um, I'm not going to make you roll for that. It probably gets close to hitting him. I don't know if it does any damage. That's not really the concern. Um, but he seems a little incredulous that you would throw the gun at him. But you can see that he 
on his actions, you're sort of turning. It looks like he's preparing to leave the house, too. Mm. Looks like he's opening a window to get out. So that said, Grandmother's going to take her action now. Simon, you're planning on throwing dynamite in, right? Yes, I'm in I'm in the door frame. Yeah, everybody has passed out of the house but you. So if you would like to, you may make your throw roll. 14 under 36. That's a hard. Uh, hard. Okay. And I had the two sticks and I am running. Once I toss, I turn and go. Okay. So I'm going to have you roll damage for me. How much is it? A stick of dynamite is what, 4d10? Yeah, so I think um, given that you have two of them, I'll say it's 6d10. Seems reasonable. 36 points of damage. Uh, So you launch these sticks inside the hearth, and they immediately ignite and explode. There is a massive concussive blast that goes off inside the house. Uh, I want hard dexterity rolls from you, Simon, from Maggie, from Fraser, and from the professor, given their proximity to this blast. All you can really do at this point, Lady Elizabeth, is run and hear. Uh, And you hear the blast go off for sure. Just sort of shaking my head at the silliness of thinking that would work. I'll spend two points of luck to make that a success. Wonderful. I rolled a zero six. Okay. 66 under 85. It's just a regular success. Okay. Hard requirement. Yeah. And Richard rolled a hundred. Well, that is a fumble, sir. Yes. Um, I will play a hand of fate for you and give you a reroll. Ooh. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> 98. What's your dexterity? Your dexterity is 50, right? Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah, so that's not that's not technically a fumble because it's at least 50, but you don't make the hard dexterity requirement, unfortunately. All right. Uh, so the, the walls, the floor of the cottage and everything surrounding it erupt. They are blown into so many different pieces. Because of this, It's going to be spraying all sorts of, well, we'll just say the internal bits of the cottage around. And with the failed dexterity roll, uh, you will be getting um, some acid damage, Richard. Don't ask why it's acid. Uh, So that's three points of damage. Why is it acid? You don't want the answer to that question. I would just say that certain digestive fluids can be acidic. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, So on the top of the round, after Simon's dynamite throw, the grounds of the cottage go up as something shakes the ground with a definitive series of thuds and a gigantic shadow falls over the group. And then eventually there is a pierce of light that comes through as the canopy over the home is broken and sunlight drifts in. Air is cut by an enormous pierce and roar. Inhuman, unintelligible, and it shakes the very ground with the sound. And I think that is the perfect place to end. And so thank you so much for joining us on this second portion of our Act 4 Horror on the Orient Express finale. I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you and good night.